During the Second World War, it was the responsibility of the Merchant Navy to deliver supplies from overseas to enable Britain to continue fighting. This shipping fleet had always been an integral part of the country's economy and in wartime it was essential in supplying the armed forces. Well, my grandfather was, was a, a ship's captain. Oh. He had, in fact, served in the Boer War, mm. and uh, he was on the old uh, windjammers. That uh, when they heard I was at sea, because I, as a boy, I, I detested the sea. Well, I finished up at the sea anyway, and when they found I was at sea, they they were quite pleased actually. Mm. In the First World War, the German Navy had tried to starve Britain into submission by sinking the merchant ships that were supplying them with food, fuel and military equipment. The campaign had not been successful, but by 1939 the Kriegsmarine believed that it could learn from its past mistakes. As in the First World War, Germany's principal weapon for cutting Britain's supply lines was the submarine or U-boat. Jack Armstrong joined the Merchant Navy in January 1940 in the middle of the phony war. I received half an hour's notice. The galley boy of the, the ship had absconded and uh, I was under the control of the uh, Racing Stray Society and uh, I went out to the ship with the captain on the pilot boat. I was told to take my glasses off and climbed up the rope ladder of a, a steamer in ballast with no sooner on board than the ship sailed. You have to remember that uh, I was brought to my home from the age of three. Yes. I was under the domination of other people all the time. Mm -hmm. I had no will of my own. Yes. And uh, when I eventually climbed on board that, within 24 hours, I changed from a boy into a man. At this time, the war on land may have been phony, but the war at sea was not. The first time we went to sea, we were in a convoy of six ships. Six, yeah. And those we were sailing out of the Mersey, mm -hmm. uh, one ship was bombed. I don't know, I was on the ship, the bomb dropped. It was a big blast, and I must have been thrown onto a, into some superstructure, I don't know. Because there's nothing uh, soft around a, a warship deck. Uh, so I, I don't know anything about it. I was unconscious. But the five of us left, we, we sailed, and we just left that ship. We, we, we didn't stop to consider our, our first aim was to get out. We sailed out for about two days and then we were on our own. It was January. It took us a month to do a fortnight's voyage. Yeah. We were in ballast. So every time the bow went down, the stand came up <laughs> and the propellers spun in the air. So yeah. the engineer spent, chief engineer spent all his time in the engine room 
shutting the engine down and opening it up again. Yeah. And one day we were in exactly the same situation, same place as we were 24 hours ago. The sea was so heavy you couldn't sail so, ahead. Really? Yeah. Was so it? that was my first uh, introduction to sea, uh, January North Atlantic, which is acknowledged to be the worst period at sea for the Atlantic. Some of those old tramp steamers, they've got very open bridges. Mm -hmm. it, it can be cold and icy up there. The only consolation is if the wages, waves are so rough, <coughs> you're in a, a situation where you, you, you like the rough sea, even though you hated it, you liked it because it kept the U-boats. But they, you got to remember that the U-boats with no respect to her, and, and the fact that the sea was rough didn't stop them sinking ships. Mm. After you'd say you'd done a fortnight's uh, voyage or so, mm. and you hit port, uh, your principal aim was to go ashore and get drunk. Mm -hmm. uh, I learned to understand people when I was 17. That's when I first learned that people talk a lot but never act on it. Because when I first went ashore in South America and the lads said, oh, when we get to South America we'll do so and so and so and so. So when we went to South America and I, I said to the lads, well come on then, what are we doing? And I had to lead them and I was only six, 17, 18. And that was when I began to realise that all people have feet of clay. And that's when I began to understand people. I would spend an hour or more with a, a violent, drunken man and persuading him in peaceful ways. Then somebody would come along and say, you don't come bum and upset it all again. Mm -hmm. yeah. I could learn to handle people, even now. Mm -hmm. Which became my life. After the fall of France in June 1940, German U-boats were able to operate from French ports and could now patrol further into the Atlantic. Also, the merchant navy convoys lacked effective anti-submarine escort, so the threat of being attacked was now greater than ever. Between July 1940 in early 1941, Allied merchant shipping losses rose greatly in what the U-boat crews called the happy time. When I went to sea, mm -hmm. the danger didn't occur to me at mm -hmm. all. It was later yeah. on as they, mm -hmm. the submarines started getting active. Yes. As the sh convoys got bigger and sh ships were being sunk. Yes. But we... Uh, we were aware of the danger, if you like. Yes. But um, you become fatalistic. We literally lived each day as it came. Mm -hmm. We never thought about tomorrow. If a ship was sunk, our immediate thought was, well, it's not us. And the ship just sailed on. The, regardless of the number of ships that were sunk, we as an individual ship would carry on sailing in the normal course mm -hmm. of events. And you carried about your duties in the normal course mm -hmm. of events. But, despite their newfound success, the U-boats had not severed Britain's supply line and the majority of the cargo usually got through. Did your time on the ship ever get monotonous? Did it feel like you were doing the same thing or, at all? Uh, used to get, used to get monotonous in the sense if we were doing a fortnight or more, say if we were sailing to mm -hmm. Australia, yes, we're sailing across the uh, across the Pacific. Mm -hmm. But again, against that it was good weather, yes, and uh, so we used to sunbathe. Mm -hmm. uh, the the only thing about the the ship sailing day after day after day is when you hit port, you went mad. Mm -hmm. um, 
and we used to spend every penny we had mm -hmm. so that uh, we had nothing left when we sailed back again Did you? in case we were sunk. If you think of uh, Scapa Flow, you could get the a lot of the navy could come in overnight. Now with the big battleships, you get fourteen hundred as a complement. Cruisers, thousand. You had to be fed. How many loaves in one night would they get through? And there, the small uh, puffers, the climb puffers. They were like ants, ants running around the do because they were supplying all those ships. There could be 50 ships in the scupper at any one time, from fr little frigates up, right up to big battleships. And uh, dozens and dozens of these little puffers. Oilers coming in, uh, I'm not talking of gallons, you know, just topping tanks up, 20 tons, 30 tons. Can't imagine what it's like now. Remember one occasion, particularly when we were in New York, the uh, chief steward, uh, because he knew of the circumstances, ordered twice the amount of food that he, he would require. Yes. Because he knew that they automatically cut it down. Right. And to his surprise, he got the lot. <laughs> So that for that particular voyage, we 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 lived well. <laughs> it, it was to make make the bread on board, mm -hmm. and the bread used to be uh, full of weevils mm -hmm. and maggots. Half the time, he he he, he just consumed it. He just uh, actually not did he? Well, he, he got used to it, mm -hmm. and it, it's literally true that we, mm -hmm. you. If you got a ship's biscuit, yeah. you could tap it and the weavers would come out of it. Yeah. Mm. And it was not just Britain that was receiving supplies from overseas. Russia's entry into the war created new duties for the Allied merchant navies. The Soviet Union received much of its aid via the Pacific, some via the Persian Corridor and some via a dangerous shipping lane that ran through the Arctic Ocean. Did you, did you uh, participate, did, you, uh, did your ships ever go on the Russian convoy route? No. Uh, in that I was very fortunate. No. We, uh, I was in one, I was in Glasgow, mm -hmm. or Gurk or somewhere around there, and uh, we were all being issued with uh, tropical gear. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, they were uh, uh, insulating all the ship's cabins. Mm -hmm. So uh, that told us, in spite of the issuing of the gear, mm -hmm. it uh, was the Russia they were going to. Mm -hmm. I hadn't signed on then, so I, I, I didn't sign on that ship. Although their main duty was to transport war supplies, the Allied merchant ships were also responsible for moving troops from one theatre to another. So when you were sent out there, was there a fear of U-boat attacks? Oh yeah. Oh yeah, so the convoys. Oh yeah. Were you in a convoy? Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, went out by boat. Did any ships get attacked at all in the convoy? Well, no, but we... we, we yeah, there was some of the, the uh, what do you call it, ships, cargo ships, and well, they got done, yeah, the slow ones, you see, mm -hmm. we, was, we was on the liners. We were allowed on deck at all? Yeah, at oh, certain times, yes, not, not, not all lounging about, oh no, no, discipline on there as well as, uh, you know, you slept right down below. You had to come up for boat drill with a pair of boots or whatever they wanted you to have. You've got to have it with you and, you know. How often were these boat drills? Uh, well, you used to get them uh, two or three times a week. 
but whilst the Kriegsmarine were attacking Allied merchant ships, Britain retaliated by blockading Axis ports. When, when crews first came, uh, they, they had the job uh, of, of putting mines down off France and in the Baltic. Uh, and they used to put a couple of 250 pound bombs on them. I don't know why, why they were 250, but they always were. Uh, and they used to drop these mines in various places and then they'd go and dump a couple of bombs. It's a long way from where they put the mines. I think the Germans must have known and it made them, it got them upset. But, but uh, I never knew how they, they used to know that ships were going to set sail from somewhere and go to somewhere. And uh, uh, th that, that was when, when they, they knew what Enigma was doing. Uh, I, I, I used to wonder how they got all their information, but uh, I never knew. I had my ear quite close to the ground, but, but I never knew about Enigma and, and all that goings on. But uh, we got all kinds of information, but they used to take these mines out and they, they called it gardening, which <laughs> was a bit of a euphemism. <laughs> In December 1941, the United States entered the war on the Allied side. Now, the US Merchant Navy could bring war supplies to Britain, and also the American shipyards could replace the vessels that had been sunk by U-boats. But the US Navy lacked anti-submarine vessels and was slow to enforce a convoy system. At the same time, Germany was constructing more U-boats and was quick to exploit the vulnerability of American shipping. Consequently, for the first half of 1942, Allied losses rose again, giving the Kriegsmarine a second happy time. If, if a convoy was attack, uh, attacked mainly, uh, especially if it was a big convoy, uh, you've got the order to scatter and then the, sh the ships, because although you have a, a, a lot of ships, the convoy uh, has to sail at the speed of the slowest ship, which uh, in a lot of cases uh, irks the engineers because every ship has what you call a critical speed. and to maintain that you have got to go higher or lower, it can't keep at that speed. So uh, we've actually had uh, uh, a collision at sea uh, because the, the, the ships have veered and uh, we, we, we lost uh, Davids and things on one occasion. Your, your first and immediate order, most most attacks at night, if you remember, mm -hmm. uh, is you, you get a, to scatter. Well, of course, then the engine knows, note goes down to the engine room, increase speed. So what you do is you you scatter, and that, that's your primary objective, is to get out of the way. Everything was buttoned down for action all the time, because you never knew when. A U-boat could strike either a merchant ship or a Royal Navy. And I feel sorry for the uh, merchant lads, because when they were hit, sunk, they came home, they were on the dole. The Royal Navy, of course, would re-equip you, probably gave you leave and you were paid all the time. The poor old merchant lads didn't get anything, they were finished. Straight on the door. They were. It was terrible the way they were treated, in my opinion. The worst I ever did see was uh, I, I heard a bang, and I, I was in my, my little uh, cubicle. I was engineer steward then, and I dashed out on deck. And it only matter of <coughs> about 30 seconds 
and I went went out there and I saw a ship end like that. It was kind of iron ore, as I understand, and it had just gone down like that. So in a matter of seconds, a ship sailing along like that, and then it's down like that. Mm. So there'd be no survivors off that ship. Mm. But your main concern would then is you, is to get ahead. Sometimes the Kriegsmarine deployed surface warships against the convoys, but these were far less effective than the U-boats. We had sailed on one occasion, I, I can't remember the occasion, but we were, when, when the Bismarck was out. The Bismarck? Oh, yes. Yeah. We were just one day sailing away from there. We, 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 we were sent, sent due, due north. We were told to, to head right straight up north and we went as near to the North Pole as made no difference and then cut across and come back out again and it got colder and colder. Uh, but there's a lot at sea that you don't know about because the sea is a big, big place mm -hmm. and a lot of the action is taking a place just over the horizon. Yeah. So you don't actually know of it, it's, it's only by hearsay. From the Merchant Navy point of view, the, what, what upset us was when they, they, uh, the Prince of Wales and the repulse went down in the Far East, mm -hmm. uh, being seamen, mm -hmm. it was those things that, that upset us. We, we were sea life and sea orientated. Yes. And it was uh, all the ships, you see the, uh, You'll, you'll see a picture there of, of the hood, when, when the hood went. Mm. Uh, and that, that's when we were depressed, mm -hmm. because uh, the, she was the, she was pride and joy of the British nation at the time. Mm. And uh, to, to, to go down in 30 seconds or like that, and there will be three survivors. Mm. Uh, was uh, that was a, an incalculable blow. Yeah. Mm. During the second half of 1942, more escort vessels were put into service, new anti-submarine weapons were developed, and the German naval codes were being broken. But whilst these developments made it more difficult for U-boats to attack the convoys, merchant shipping continued to suffer heavy losses. So when did you uh, actually start getting a proper anti-submarine escort? Anything like two years after before you really got any any proper escort. We used to sail across from Canada and, and the Canadian Navy used to uh, send out ships and, mm -hmm. and then they, as far as they could go and then there was a period in the middle when there was no escort. Mm -hmm. And then we would be two days off uh, the United Kingdom and get two corvettes. It was uh, one occasion we brought the six Lee Slend boats across, mm -hmm. and the Lee Slend boats, uh, in our case, had been taken fresh off the stocks. It was a U.S. mail ship. Mm -hmm. And the first ships that were handed over to us were uh, straight off the stocks. We had a, an all-American Navy escort, including an aircraft carrier. When it was fine, we put a plane up in the air to make sure that those six ships got across. Mm -hmm. And when the American Navy handed over, they handed over to two corvettes. And we, we just laughed about it, you see, because the, the Navy, American Navy, was determined that those ships get, get across there. Mm -hmm. We had nearly as many escort as we had ships, <laughs> and we handed over the two corvettes. In the middle of 1943, new, long-range, 
radar-equipped aircraft were assigned to patrol the North Atlantic, armed with anti-submarine weapons. U-boats were especially vulnerable to aerial attacks, and this, in combination with improved Allied technology and enhanced convoy protection, meant that merchant shipping losses had rapidly declined by the end of 1943, while submarine losses had increased significantly. Now, the Kriegsmarine had evidently lost the Battle of the Atlantic, but they continued to attack Britain's supply line, and although they never achieved another happy time, their presence could never be ignored. I remember coming into uh, Scapa, and three ships were sunk, one after the other. It was, people didn't realise that, huh? how much devastation those U-boats caused. And I remember somewhere, reading in 1943, the U-boat menace was over. Whoever wrote that must have been an idiot, because they were still fighting in 1945 and sinking our ships. I never ever felt safe, because he, even with the, with the hundred ships, the uh, uh, you, you're still a sense of danger, and mm -hmm. ships still went. Mm -hmm. The uh, you will get some destroyers, but the, you have to remember that most of the the bigger ships mm -hmm. were were not actually in uh, at the convoy. They would sail up and down the convoy lanes. Yes. The commerce raiding would continue until Germany was defeated, but the most hazardous times were now past. The Battle of the Atlantic had inflicted heavy losses on both sides. 72,000 Allied personnel had been killed, whilst 30,000 German sailors had died. Despite these appalling losses, at no point between 1939 and 1945 did the Kriegsmarine ever manage to sever the supply lines between Britain and America. But although the sailors of the British Merchant Navy had played a critical role in sustaining the war effort, they received little recognition for their actions. After the war they were forgotten for all the work they'd done and one thing or another. But eventually somebody, somebody kept at, at the uh, organisers, as you might as well say, of, mm -hmm. of uh, Army's uh, job and uh, mm -hmm. they got them to, to parade. What shocked me when I went on that holiday in 2000, outside of HMS Sparrowhawk, which is a, an industrial estate now, near the, the old guard room, there was a big uh, notice board up to the honour of the men that flew out from here and never returned. And that had been put up in 1999. It had taken them all that time, which I thought was terrible, really, because a lot didn't return. It was a way of life, and if 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 you were. If you were sunk, from our point of view, it was unfortunate. Mm -hmm. You see, uh, so we were on tankers, and when we were carrying high octane, mm -hmm. uh, we used to say to ourselves, well, at least if we get hit, we won't know anything about it. And that was the way we lived. By late 1942, the Allied merchant navies had brought large numbers of men and equipment to Europe. It was time for the Allies to counter-attack.